the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Boomers have been pushing all their lives for a let loose all the diversity and individualism of America, all their talents, all their vices and virtues, let it go. And this is the result. We're living in it today, right? We're living in the end point of those trends. And the result is a country which has become almost ungovernable. Now here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck, along with David McIlvaney. Our guest today, Neil Howe. Dave, this is our fourth time to have him on. And uh, he, he wrote an excellent book called The Fourth Turning. You are the one who turned the office on to this. What was that? Well over a decade ago. Yeah, and it's been a really helpful overlay for thinking about changes in the macro economy, uh, anticipation of many of the things that we've talked about, whether it's financial market issues, economic concerns, political dysfunction, even geopolitical conflict. There's a way of looking at things which can be sort of dire in nature, almost sort of terminal. You know, things are getting worse and worse until they get worser. And, and that's really not what you get with this particular model of history. The fourth turning, what cycles of history tell us about America's next rendezvous with destiny, it kind of gives you an, an impression that over the last 600 years combining Anglo and so English and American history, you've got this pattern of recurrence and things do get worse and then they do get better. And it's just a helpful pattern. It's worth noting that models are helpful for explaining how things work. They're, they're useful for organizing data and understanding what it means. We also know from the history of science that models change and that interpretive frameworks, uh, once accepted as a helpful sort of Rosetta Stone by which you understand and interpret things, they can be discarded. So you had the Ptolemaic model accepted for hundreds of years, then came the Copernican model. Where are the flaws in this model? It's something that a listener should be thinking about. And, and, and yes, it's helpful, very helpful. And it continues to be it after almost a decade and a half of, of, of ruminating on its content and reading it, rereading it three or four times. It's just worth turning over. That was something that I was careful about when I read. Anytime I read a book that says, okay, this is a model that repeats over and over and over, that can be very useful, but you also want to keep in mind that it is a model. You, you know, you had brought up the Ptolemaic model. That was when people believed that, you know, everything circled the, the earth, you know, earth-centric. And then Copernicus, that was heliocentric. And, you know, if we go to the stars down the road, we're going to have to look at a different model than just heliocentric. And same thing with fourth turning. One of the things that impresses me about Neil Howe, though, is I can go back and listen to the past shows, 2011, 2017. Uh, like you said, this is the fourth time that we're interviewing him. It's a useful model. This is a book that was written in the early 1990s and came out, I think it was in the mid-90s. And it's still being used now. In fact, not only is it a model, in a way, it's a talking point. You'll hear people say, well, we're in a fourth turning. Well, that's a cliche at this point. Neil Howe, great to have you back on the program. We were interested in getting your perspective on the state of our union about six months after the Trump administration moved into the Oval Office. So the last time you were on the program was July 2017. Prior to that, in May of 2011, with the global financial crisis still working its way through the system, even then, nearly 10 years ago, we were addressing a rise in populism globally and a breakdown of civic institutions. We spoke more recently in 2017, of the, of the Bannon fascination with culture and uh, Steve Bannon's influence coming through the election process, to some degree capitalizing on popular discontent. And we spoke about complacency in the markets, adding to risk dynamics uh, across asset classes. Actually, uh, spent a good bit of time in, in previous conversations, Neil, with the Minsky thesis, his instability thesis, basically stability begets instability. Now, now we're pre-election 2020, and it's important to see this race from multiple vantage points, not partisan vantage points, but, but I think more critically, the cultural and historical vantage points. We want to explore your insights on the fourth turning, a long period of transition with a distinct mood reflecting generational differences, and obviously put in a time and place where the consequences of past policy preferences get played out. Uh, in brief, uh, that kind of period is, is one you refer to as a period of crisis. Let's start for the benefit of our new listeners with sort of a 20-second summary, <laughs> if you can do that, uh, of, of the fourth turning 
thesis. And our listeners can, of course, go back to the May 2011 interview, the July 2017 interviews. If they want to explore it more, better yet, read the book, uh, The Fourth Turning. Let's look at The Fourth Turning thesis in brief, and then let's frame up this election cycle in light of the thesis. Yes, uh, better yet, read the book. A uh, new book, by the way, is going to be due uh, probably um, in uh, early 2022. So, you know, it's not over uh, in terms of what I'm writing about it. But basically, the thesis is, and this began actually in a, a book that Bill Strauss and I wrote in the late 1980s. It goes back to actually 1991 as the book Generations, and then later on, Fourth Turning, which was in 1997 is that um, the social mood in America follows a cyclical pattern and that the cycle is driven by generational aging. That is to say, you know, history creates generations and, and shapes them. And then later on, these generations get older and they in turn shape the mood, right? So it's, a, it's sort of a completed loop, a completed feedback loop. And that one particular aspect of this cycle is a period, a generation long era, 20 years or so of civic upheaval and civic recreation, uh, which is typically coincided with, you know, wars, revolutions, you know, that I'm talking about big civic upheavals that really redefine who we are as a nation. And these have occurred about every 80 or 90 years in American history, going all the way back to the very late, you know, 17th century when we're just colonists, the, the glorious revolution, the, the war of Spanish succession, and then a uh, lifetime later, we had the American Revolution, the American Civil War, the, the New Deal, and, and World War II, and then, and then here we are today. And that there are generational drivers behind that, uh, whether or not you're shaped in that event or you were born right after it. Uh, and just to complete the idea, we also have observed uh, periods of cultural awakening, which occur roughly halfway in between those civic crises. Uh, most recently, the 60s and 70s, but we've had our, you know, fourth, fourth, fifth, sixth great awakenings in American history. And that this is the other side of the cycle. So in, in these awakening events, we recreate the inner world of America, culture, values, religion, pop culture, all the rest of it. And then the, in the civic crises, we recreate the outer world, politics, economics, infrastructure, you know, the objective, not the subjective uh, side of, of who we are. I don't know. That, there we go. It was probably a little bit more than 20 seconds, uh, but there you have it. And as we look at the election cycle coming up, um, you know, we're, we're in that fourth turning, a period where things are beginning to feel the excesses of, of the previous cycle. And that's getting played out. Uh, maybe we see that in financial terms. Maybe we see it in in social terms. There's a number of places for it to express itself. And sure enough, we get to, in the democratic society that we have, uh, express our feelings and thoughts about the future through the ballot box. So maybe take that thesis and, and apply it to 2020 in November and, and, and uh, what you see there. Well, we see just a deepening mood that we're in. I mean, one element that we've seen over the past decade is this growth in um, authoritarianism and populism around the world. And, you know, Europe, uh, I think particularly South Asia, East Asia, and Latin America most recently in the past couple of years. And obviously, we're seeing some of that in the United States, right? And this is, to some extent, these generational currents are, are global. You know, they're, they're aligned. Uh, it's not just us. Uh, it's happening everywhere. And I think, I think we certainly saw it with the election of, of Donald Trump, I would say the most incredibly unlikely candidate in American history to win an election. But it really said something about where the American mood is. And now, of course, we're coming into 2020. Um, we've seen the Democratic Party move ideologically uh, faster than I've ever seen it move my lifetime. Uh, we have a candidate who's clearly a moderate in his party seeking to portray. I think we, we've actually seen now in the convention that's taking place, the online, incredible online convention that we now have, a reasonably moderate face of the party. But there's no question that this party is moving very rapidly, you know, to Things that we wouldn't really have imagined, uh, a doubling of the federal minimum wage, uh, you know, uh, government provision of, of higher education for everyone, some form of higher education, you know, free college for all or free college for most, perhaps. 
And then uh, a large uh, infrastructure and uh, new New Deal or Green New Deal program and large changes in the tax structure and all the rest. I, I think it's coming at a time almost as an anticlimax because some of the biggest changes we've seen uh, were already introduced with the pandemic, right? The really practical implementation of modern monetary theory and flooding our economy with liquidity, uh, both uh, you know fiscal stimulus and you know Fed purchases uh, to their balance sheet uh, on an order of magnitude higher than we've ever seen before in history. And it was funny, uh, it, it, late in the 2019, the charge was that you know Bernie Sanders was a socialist and America wouldn't elect a socialist. And now it's like we're all socialists. I mean, we're all wards of the state. <laughs> I, I don't know yeah, you, but I can't think of an asset owner now who doesn't know that they would be toast had it not been for this massive uh, Fed intervention or workers who know that they counted on uh, that uh, federal unemployment bonus plus PPP to keep them where they are today. So we've had this weird period with the most enormous real economic shock in terms of employment and production uh, that we've had since the Great Depression and perhaps even more rapid even than the Great Depression uh, actually happened economically. And yet we've completely hidden it by this enormous flow of largesse, right? And now it's an interesting question. I think equally important with the upcoming election is the threat that stimulus may stop for a while. And as you know, I think everyone in American economics is really trying to track that interruption of stimulus plus the coming back of COVID-19 infections are running about you know, deaths nationwide on a seven-day average are about double where they were a month ago. It used to be around 500. Now they're over 1,000. And the idea that that could get worse as we move into the fall, obviously you have climate playing a role. Uh, is that going to further depress the economy or is COVID going to go away and we're going to get stimulus reconfirmed, you know, once Mitch McConnell and Pelosi and all those people can meet again and Trump can sign on. I think that's one of the big uncertainty right now. We're always on the on the razor edge of that one, but we can see enormous uh, macro uncertainty either way. I do think that if, if stimulus is reconfirmed, uh, Biden is elected and Biden is expected, we'll want to continue this uh, stimulus for a while. Uh, we could see real danger of inflation expectations are really accelerating again. And it's worth to keep in mind, although, um, you know, Jerome Powell denies it. He says, you know, the yield curve is is uh, nailed to the floor for two years. You know, nothing's going to change his mind. I mean, he wants to do everything possible to, to keep expectations firmly rooted. There's no question that if you see a real surge in inflation expectations, then all games are off for the Fed, right? That's a complete game changer. Suddenly borrowing money is no longer free again. You know, we saw indication of that last week in the bond market as we get a uh, higher than expected CPI and PPI read. And there is a small revolution of the bond market, very small, but still across the yield curve, 10 year to 30. It was painful to be in those safe havens, treasuries and really anything in fixed income. So, yeah, there's there's this presumption of control in the interest rate world, but maybe some concerns with inflation. Well, you, you see signs of it. I mean, uh, this kind of continual fall in the dollar and acceleration in commodity prices. Um, and, you know, you look at gold. I mean, you look at kind of all the obvious signposts, right? And you just see, OK, the market is expecting something. They're getting ready for something longer term here. And it's not a huge further leg down in uh, depression and deflation. Although, again, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty right now. I think the failure to uh, sign on to an extension of stimulus just renders even more uncertainty right now in the outlook. I think most people were, certainly we were, uh, expecting that to, uh, that was too important for Trump uh, not to sign on. Uh, and I think I was surprised at everyone else that uh, they failed to come to an agreement. I, I thought in the end, Trump had to have that for his election, if nothing else. In fact, Given Trump's love of debt, I, I'm surprised he didn't come out with a, a four trillion dollar plan and call it the Trump plan <laughs> and then dare Pelosi to, to match him. <laughs> I think that would have been the master political gambit. But, you know, that didn't happen. I think 
on the conservative side and on the Trump side, I think, you know, Trump, the whole idea of the Postal Service seemed to stick in his craw. And I think for the conservative Republicans, I mean, this whole thing doesn't taste very good to them. I think, I think neither of them wanted to give all that much money to, to, to uh, state and local governments. So anyway, that's kind of where it ended. You know, so you've you've got this idea within what you wrote in the fourth turning that crisis brings reform and both crisis and the period that follows it are are long and, and the changes occur over a longer period of time. Um, you mentioned sort of the anticlimax with the pandemic. And, you know, so we're sort of moving towards this ultimate period of crisis and then a response to it. And yet we've had something that's it kind of blown up in advance and almost uh uh, you know, created, we now have events catching up with policy. It raises the stakes. I mean, uh, you know, you talk about a Minsky moment and, and how, you know, in, in Minsky's paradigm, uh, you know, complacency breeds risk taking. Uh, but there's always ways you can raise it to another level to simply raise the stakes. And I think we did that with macroeconomic policy this year. We basically said, okay, well, we're just going to put so much liquidity into the system. And of course, you know, the, there's so much disintermediation now. So many companies are borrowing in markets that the Fed now had to actually back the bond markets as well as back the banks, you know, and, and bring interest rates down. And that combined with this extraordinary fiscal stimulus, uh, the CBO now estimates at the end of 2021, we're going to be at something like 108 percent of GDP and a publicly held national debt. That's higher than we were at the end of World War II, right? And we never had a war. <laughs> well, again, that's affordable once interest rates are down near zero, right? But what happens if they start rising again? Suddenly everything begins to change. And that's the problem now. There's a lot more at stake from the macro point of view. Raise the stakes, increase debt to solve what was a debt problem seems like an echo of what we did in 2008 and 2009. Not that we have to learn from the past, um, but we had the opportunity to. You say that periods repeat, celestial ones exactly, social ones approximately. A question I've had and just you know, lingered on going through your book multiple times, could those social periods take on a different dimension? under a planned economy where social mood or its expression, where its expression is managed. Well, spin that out a little bit, David. I don't know. Give me an example or, or what exactly you're talking about. Yeah. So let's say, for instance, you've got China and you could cross apply this to the U.S., just take the same uh, technological wherewithal. But this is a place where you get sesame credits. If you're a good citizen, uh, you get bonus points. If you're a bad citizen, you're marked down and there's benefits, uh, life benefits uh, to being a good citizen. And so if you don't like what's in the news, uh, shut up about it or you're going to get uh, negative credits. And, and, and this, this idea that somehow we can um, sort of manage behavior and manage the feeling in the marketplace, or at least uh, shut off its expression. The most extreme version might be, you know, a kill switch for the internet. Um, but much short of that, you know, the, the idea that you're sort of controlling the narrative, can you take these social periods as we move towards crisis? And particularly now post pandemic, you see almost a top down management structure. Here's what we will do. Here's what you must do. Can you somehow take the crisis dynamic and manage that social mood such that you have a, a different kind of outcome than you've had in the past? Well, I think actually the managing of communication, uh, the managing of everything from the top has been a feature of all fourth turns in our history. It was certainly true during the American Revolution. Uh, you know, you back the wrong position, you know, tarred and feathered, ridden out on a rail. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of terror that went on during the American Revolution. Uh, and a large share of America did not support it, particularly non-English speakers. Um, and many of them went to Canada or <laughs> stayed quiet or went back to Britain, right? So every fourth turning has been a, a shock and awe project, a project of an intimidation. And it usually results in a post-crisis era in which opinions are much more homogenous, right? These are the era of good feelings you know, to talk about that that era, you know, late in the Virginian presidencies of Madison and Monroe. But uh, look at the 1950s. 
I mean, you know, how much extremist uh, stuff was allowed in the media back then? I mean, my memory of the uh, 50s and 60s is one of, or at least early 60s, was one of a very homogeneous media, uh, bland. As you know, we had a fairness doctrine back there, and we had three big networks, and, you know, they all stayed kind of within the rails. Um, There was a suffocating conformity of those decades, right, that a lot of people, frankly, today might be nostalgic for, at least those who remember that time. So it does result in a different kind of America, and it does require, once you have to mobilize society for one single purpose, as happens in a fourth turning, uh, everyone's got to be on the same page, right? Uh, and that, that happens in the heat of the moment, and it usually has after effects. After the crisis is, is over, I have no question that the ultimate use of social media to foster and amplify social solidarity, political solidarity, is absolutely in our future, and not just in the social credit system in China, all over the world, which I think is why uh, Google and Facebook are trying desperately to get rid of the responsibility for doing it. I, I think ultimately uh, they will want to set up government boards to do it so that they won't have to. They can't possibly be the lightning rod for that. That is our future. And ultimately, when millennials take over in midlife, we're going to have a much more homogeneous uh, uh, political culture. It's going to be much more uh, uh, sedate, uh, cleaned up. Uh, there's going to be a, a, a lot less edginess to it. And I have no doubt about that. It's going to be a little bit like the GI generation back in the 30s, who obviously many of them became communists, many of them became radicals. Uh, but by the time they inherited America's culture in the 50s and, and early 60s, took over the presidency with, with JFK in, in 1961, uh, it was it was kind of a, a um, what they would have called a, a cleaned up, happified America, right? Accentuate the positive, don't keep harping on the negative. And of course, that's how they got into huge arguments with their boomer kids who just didn't understand the purpose of always shutting up about anything negative, right? Um, always, always project a, a happy and complacent and integrated view of American life. But I will say this about the GI generation. They took America in that post-war era. By the time they started retiring, which would have been the mid to late 1960s, they took America to its low point of economic inequality in the 20th century in terms of both wealth and income, which the Gini coefficient probably reached its all-time low in the late 60s, very early 1970s. And, you know, younger generations took over and just pushed America in a completely different way. Obviously, uh, the silent generation, particularly boomers after them, were much more in favor of untethering individualism. And boomers in particular, much more comfortable with uh, inequality uh, and individuals going their own way. Boomers hated the idea of a strong middle class. Do you remember all that conformity, the Pleasant Valley Sunday? And, you know, we all thought the same and we were, all, we were all relatively similar. Boomers have been pushing all their lives for a let loose all the diversity and individualism of America, all their talents, all their vices and virtues, let it go. And this is the result. We're living in it today, right? We're living in the end point of those trends. And the result is a country which has become almost ungovernable. Uh, But again, this too has a rhythm to it. Uh, America felt the same way back in the 1920s, and it felt the same way in the 1850s. Yeah, the fourth turning, um, you document these periods of time. The first one that you document began with the War of the Roses, 1458, 1487. Uh, that time frame then moves forward to the Armada Crisis, followed by the Glorious Revolution, uh, 1675 to 1704, the American Revolution, 1773 to 94, the Civil War, and then the, the, the most recent one, the Great Depression, World War II, from 29 to 46. And, and then now, of course, the crisis era we're in today. In each of these, it's the old civic order. Uh, which was displaced by a new one. And you've already started helping us to imagine a new civic order emerging from the current secular upheaval. That would be the sedate, the cleaned up, the, you know, almost something similar to the GI generation post-crisis. But we've got to get there. Right. You know, maybe, maybe fill that out a little bit more in terms of, you know, imagine that new 
civic order it is i mean it's really easy for me to see when you describe terror which is today present if you're on the wrong side of history you should be afraid because social media amplifying social consequences the doxing of of individuals the firing of uh, even tenured professors for whatever it, it's it's a fascinating thing to want peace and to want something that is more homogenized and perhaps <laughs> dare I say, civilized, um, you can see how that might be a response to the current atmosphere. Well, it always is. And, um, you know, we saw that in the 30s everywhere in the world. Uh, people wanting peace. They wanted solidarity. They wanted consensus. Uh, and you, ha you have to live long enough through a period when that wasn't the case to understand why people long for it. I think the challenge for America, as it has always been in such cases, is to come together as, as a nation, as a people, and yet to preserve the underlying liberties that they value. I, ironically and interestingly, David, in almost all of our great crises, we've come together as a nation, but it's always to protect America against an enemy, another, that represented enslavement. <laughs> you know what I mean? The, the opposite of liberty. You know, whether it was Britain or whether it was the slaveocracy of, of, you know, unbridled expansion of the South, or, or whether it was um, whether it was the growth of, of, of fascism, right? There's always a vision of the complete enslavement, right? Which requires the country to come together, to actually take away liberties in order to preserve what liberties it truly values, right? And I, I think it's that balance, which I think we will have to watch. Uh, the complete adoption of a social credit system in the United States, I don't think will ever happen. And in fact, in any upcoming conflict with China, I think that will be how the issue is posed, right? Does America want to become and drawn into that kind of world? So that's how it's going to come down. I, I think one thing you have to watch for, if, if you're really looking at where we end up, I think equality is going to be a big issue. It was in the 30s, uh, and it certainly was not, not just as an ideological issue, but in fact, uh, we became a much more equal society coming out of the 30s and particularly the 40s. A lot of that was done almost equally. Part of it was deliberate through government uh, taxation and, and uh, benefit programs. A lot of it was done simply due to destruction of pre-existing wealth, you know, either physical destruction or just destruction of its, of its uh, market cap. But that will be one thing. There's a great book by, uh, on this, actually, if anyone's interested, sort of a longer uh, period of history by Walter Scheidel called The Great Leveler, on how it's uh, in, in, ever since the Neolithic Revolution, you know, 10,000 years ago, uh, societies, civilizations always become more unequal over time. It's a great book. Except for periods of great crisis, right? Those are always the great equalizers, what he calls the great levelers. And these are plagues, famines, total revolutions, and total wars. <laughs> so <laughs> I know that's not a happy way to look at history, but I mean, think about it. Inevitably, in peacetime, we all sort of entrench our own interests, the interest of our families, right? Now look around America today, right? We've got older people who've entrenched their own interests in the budget, we got Prop 13 in America, which is actually now hereditary, right? You can pass on the tax value of your home to your kids, believe it or not. Uh, you know, that, that favored tax value. I mean, we've become an incredible uh, grandfather clause society, right, where we've entrenched our interests in. It takes a crisis to break that stuff apart. And people sometimes tell me, you know, Neil, you're, you're fourth turning. It just sounds like a lot of chaos and disaster. And I say, no. You clear out all the stuff that throttles growth and freedom and that prevents the next generation, right, from growing. You rewrite the playing field away from the old back to the young again. That's another theme, by the way, of, of Fourth Turnings going into what follows. And that is a huge new emphasis on investing in the young, which we haven't seen before. I mean, higher education, when boomers are growing up, was still largely funded by the public. We move toward completely socializing the cost of growing old in this country and privatizing the cost of raising kids, right? And then we wonder why the fertility rate's going down. <laughs> you know, David, I mean, think right. about that. Right. The incentives are obvious, isn't it? 
I mean, you don't have any kids. You're a free rider. It's all the other kids are going to pay their payroll taxes to keep you, you know, with income when you're old. And but if you have a kid, you have to fund everything yourself. Well, where did we ever get that kind of balance? Well, you know, in recent decades, that's how we've moved really ever since the 1970s. We've been moving in that direction. So that's another big thing that will happen. I think in terms of culture, we will actually move toward conventionality, uh, reinforcement of, you know, nor- conventional norms. And these will be actually, that may seem surprising to believe right now, but that's going to be somewhere in kind of the, you know, ethnic and linguistic center of America. It's going to be a world in which the fringes will be de-emphasized. Um, and populism always moves in that direction, successful populism. It always moves toward legitimizing the center of the culture, never the fringes. Uh, that's actually, that was true even in the American Revolution. It was true in you know, Vietnam, which is actually a place I got to see actually in person uh, before that finally went down. Uh, and it's true, it's true around the world today. Uh, look at Narendra Modi in India. Look at Xi Jinping bringing back the great Han in China. Look at Shinzo Abe, you know, bringing back traditional culture in Japan. Look at Rodrigo Duterte. Look around the world today and see what's happening with populism. It always champions the center, the majoritarian culture. And that's how you harness a people into actually cohering and actually doing things. Now, right now, these societies, some of them are still in periods of great upheaval. I don't know if you just saw the recent election in Sri Lanka. The same thing happened again. One family basically in charge, enormous landslide election. And they are, again, the kind of the, the Buddhist ethnic center of that society. Look at Burma today, where the Buddhists are actually expelling the, the Muslim Moringa. Yeah, and I don't want to go into that detail. But you look around and there's a reason why Freedom House now has its 14th consecutive year of declining uh, liberalism and democracy around the world. Uh, It is because all of these peoples are trying to energize their latent energies around, frankly, kind of majoritarian ethnic worldviews. And this is just something you have to look at and you have to understand why that's happening. Now, typically, You know, in America, we've been a somewhat much more diverse culture just by who we are, a nation of immigrants. There are are only a handful of them. I think most of them in the world today happen to be of Anglo-Saxon origin. You know, New Zealand, Australia, and so on. Uh, Canada, uh, very high immigration rates, uh, reasonably diverse cultures. But even they are undertake this shift. And I think that's another thing to look for. We have a number of things, uh, as you recall from the chapter we wrote on the fourth turning that you can look for. Obviously, the possibility of the nation galvanizing around some total all-important civic project, right, with a particular end, is highly likely. And typically in our history, it's it's been a war, usually a, a total war, right? And that's, I think, also something you should look for. Uh, hopefully, we can avoid the tragedy and destruction, but it needs to be something of urgency for the nation to actually to execute in some way. Well, when you're talking about Xi Jinping, Narendra Modi, Vladimir Putin, Duterte, Shinzo Abe, when you're talking about them seeking an ethnic center, focusing on nationalism, I mean, we, we can think of them strictly as authoritarian leaders, but you're right, they're trending and taking advantage of social mood as well. And it's 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 in sort of a deglobalization trend that they're moving towards their ethnic center. It's a deglobalization trend. Yeah. So bring in this aspect of, of geopolitical um, <laughs> geopolitical problems usually express themselves when people have very clear understanding of who they are. And it's distinct from who anyone else is. And, and you know, there's an emphasis on rights and what is best for us. And and sort of that nationalist trend, you, you, you tend to see sort of transnational emphasis and, and, and a move towards understanding yourself as a global citizen in one period of history. And then it kind of shrinks back from this vague identity of who we are to a very specific identity of who we are. And that very specific identity of who we are does coincide with some conflict because now it's not about all of us. It's about us versus them. Well, right. And um, this has also been unleashed in Eastern Europe, obviously. Um, You know, Eastern Europe 
was, uh, you know, it's like the way we used to talk about the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, right? A, a prisoner of nations, right? Well, these nations have been unleashed, you know, and, and now they're expressing themselves, right, uh, in their nationalistic particularity. And again, you look at Hungary and Poland, and they're a challenge now to the, to the prevailing orthodoxy in the EU. It's interesting, too, that, uh, that in most of these countries, they're getting most of their support from younger voters. Uh, that's certainly true. In um, you know India, China, Japan, you know, the, well, all the ones I just mentioned, and that's that's where you know that you are in a, a kind of pre-crisis as opposed to post-crisis mood. You know, typically after a crisis is over, uh, the generation that vanquished the opposition that created all these new institutions during the crisis, right? They sort of sit on that after a while. There's a sense of great sort of. Uh, uh, satisfaction, complacency, perhaps, and they've built all these new strong institutions in the heat of the crisis, and they tend to think very highly of these institutions as they grow older, right? So the younger generation tends to be more uh, protesting for more individuality, for more personal space, for more personal freedom, right? Uh, less restrictive institutions. And that's what we experienced, obviously, in the 1960s, you know, a, a post-war boomer generation attacking everything that their parents had built <laughs> during the crisis, right? All of the all of the concrete they were pouring, all of the harbors and dams they were still building in the interstates and everything else, right? Um, and that is typical pattern. I think what happens is, is you wait a few decades after that, and what happens is ultimately you find that it's the older generation that's protecting, you know, that, that young generation of, of rebels and protesters eventually grows old and they're protecting a more individualistic society. And it's the younger generation that suddenly wants more order. They want more solidarity, right? They want government and big institutions to actually do more, right? Which is exactly the opposite of what boomers wanted. And I think that's what you're getting today uh, around much of the world, is you're getting young people who want big institutions to do more. So populism was a defining characteristic of 2011 to 2016. If you go back and replay the Five Star Movement, Syriza, even here in the U.S., the Tea Party, is it possible, kind of tying in the COVID thematics, is it possible that COVID provides governments around the world the opportunity to silence the popular voice and unify institutional civic initiatives around a common threat? Well, what happens ultimately is populism moves from becoming the outside to the inside. I mean, what happens when populists, this is why populism and authoritarianism are actually two sides of the same coin. And that goes back historically to the very origin of the term. Who were the first populares, as we used to call them, you know, in, in Latin? Uh, they were the ones who supported Caesar. <laughs> he, was, he was the first dictator. I mean, he was the first, you know, he spelled the end of, of the Roman Republic. And those who opposed him were the optimates, you know, the, the good people, the senators, you know, the, the elite class, those who deserve to rule. Well, when a popular party takes over, because it's pushing out all the, all the encrusted elites who used to run things, they need one person, Right to embody their will and run it, right? I mean, you got the logic here, right? So you need, the, the uh, mm -hmm. populism almost needs a single authority figure to give expression to what it wants. And this is why the two have always been linked historically. Um, and ultimately what happens when populism finally succeeds is it creates this extremely effective authoritarian government that can actually get things done. And that's very convenient. Well, if it may be very welcome in a crisis. I think one aspect of the pandemic that I think has been particularly demoralizing for Americans is to realize what a dysfunctional country they've become relative to the rest of the world, right? It has exposed all of our civic vulnerabilities that we don't follow laws, that we don't trust our leaders, that we have no top-down federal power. I mean, you know, I don't have the end of this, David, but you want to look at deaths per capita going on now in, 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 uh, in Australia or New Zealand, even New Zealand, right? A, a new wave consisting of what? <laughs> Six infected people in a population of five million. 
uh, Trump was actually crowing about that the other day. You know, well, it looks like New Zealand wasn't successful after all. I think we have six new infections about every five minutes in this country. My point is, is that we do have areas which actually practice successful containment and then now have almost no mobility restrictions. You can go to New Zealand. No one's wearing face masks, right? A successfully practiced containment strategy can actually work. But in America, we don't have the capacity to do it. We simply don't have the political trust. We don't have the will. We don't have the institutions in place. And so we're sitting here with a higher current death per capita rate than any other high income nation in the world. And, and, and Americans know that. And you can see that in the opinion polls. America gives very poor ratings today to how America has responded to this crisis. And it's partly because we no longer demonstrate the civic talents that we used to demonstrate earlier in history. And I think going into a fourth turning, that's the realization that we reach is that how disorganized and dysfunctional we come from a civic perspective. And interestingly, if you look at opinion polls, millennials, the younger generation, is most in favor of strict containment and a national top-down policy, which is interesting, David, when you think about it, because from a, and by the way, this is true with about 20 percentage points, older people most want voluntary containment. You know, no one tells me what to do, right? I mean, I can go, if I don't want to wear a mask, I won't wear it. I'm an individual, all of this stuff. Those are your early wave Xers and boomers who are saying that. Uh, millennials want a strict containment policy. And it's interesting when you look at it from a self-interest point of view, it's exactly opposite to their self-interest, or it's, I should say contrary to their self-interest. Millennials are the most likely to lose work and lose income with strict containment, and they're the least likely to get sick or die from this disease, right? So if millennials were acting in their own self-interest, they would be most in favor of no containment at all. But I do think the reason why you're seeing millennials do that is they sense just an awesome civic vacuum in this country, and they're trying to respond to that. You know, we talked about slow motion crisis um, back in 2017, and I, I think of the rolling blackouts in California years ago. They've returned this summer. And the crisis dynamics seem to be sort of rolling as well. I'm thinking specifically in terms of financial markets, but the tech crash in 2000, 2001, followed by massive monetary and fiscal interventions that gave us the real estate bubble crash of 2008 and nine, which followed. Of course, that opened up the global financial crisis. And ever since... There's been far more aggressive monetary policy, uh, fiscal policy, and uh, as you mentioned earlier, the largest deficits outside of wartime. And it, it seems like the crisis has been trying to express itself for a long time. And various interventionist measures have, have taken it off the boil temporarily. Is this the slow motion crisis we spoke of back in 2017, where gradually all political leadership is tested? and over time, discredited. Well, yeah, and it is, and, and you keep upping the ante, right? I mean, you know, you use all that liquidity, you stave it off, but of course that just means ultimately a much bigger thing will have to be, a bigger challenge will have to be dealt with. We see, you know, the, the things that I see on the horizon in terms of real crises catalyst right now, and I would say this is all within the next 18 months as I see it. I, I've already mentioned one of them. That's rising inflation expectations, which I think would suddenly take everything we're now doing off the table, right? I mean, everything now the Fed's doing, and have to reverse course. And, and so all of the stuff that we just consider our ultimate backup, right, to all our palliatives, you know, let's just make sure everyone has income. You know, if money's free, if we can pay it back in the year, you know, five centuries from now, uh, what? You, let's just print it. I mean, literally, uh, almost a helicopter money phenomenon has been in force. Uh, you look at the income breakdown of the uh, of, of the people who are receiving unemployment now. It's actually amazing. It's, it's regressive. Uh, we're just basically giving money to everyone right now. And obviously, what the Fed is doing is completely regressive. And, and who's benefiting from that policy? Who's uh, first order uh, benefiting from that policy? 
and not not only in the short term, for the long term, because, of course, this ensconces and protects, you know, the S&P 500, all the incumbents, right, uh, and prevents, you know, prevents the creative destruction of capitalism. So all of that's in place, but in inflation expectations ruins that and forces everything to change, right? I think the second thing is... Um, is the situation with China. I believe that what's happening now in Hong Kong is actually has an almost inexorable logic. It's a little bit like a slow motion prequel to World War I, where inevitably, China, basically, Xi Jinping is absolutely adamant. He is going to suppress all of these movements in Hong Kong and ultimately He's going to bring the entire power of China to bear on this. And I think ultimately, not just the United States, but the UK and the EU are going to have to respond to this. And ultimately, that means sanctions. And they're already being in place on individuals. Once those sanctions are, are in place on actual corporations, and that involves the banks, that becomes kind of like a nuclear option financially and in terms of trade. And I think people aren't focused enough on how quickly that could snowball and cause a huge decline in, in, in global trade. And, and obviously, Trump is doing a lot of other actions, too, in telecommunications and, and uh, so, you know, <laughs> social media companies, uh, Chinese social media companies were delivering ultimatums and so on. So much is going on in other fronts as well. But I would just remind you that these sanctions efforts and these you know, punishment proposals against China have sailed through both the House and the Senate with almost no opposition. These are unanimous votes. How often in America today do you find unanimous votes? And both Biden and Trump are trying to out hawk each other right now on China. I find that uh, fascinating and ominous. Well, if you want to know kind of what direction uh, you know, that whole standoff is going to go. And I think the other issue will be what kind of economic and social and perhaps even cultural policies are put in place, you know, if and when Biden wins in November, uh, because I think the other wild card on the table is attempts of nullification by states, uh, particularly red zone states, and, um, you know, perhaps even as time goes on, secession. Uh, one, one way, David, I, I sometimes like to think about this in, in thinking about red zone and blue zone in America today is that, is that each of them has a very um, a kind of a one sided dysfunctional approach to what's required civically. And that is what's required to govern a country civically. And that is the red zone believes in authority, uh, but has very little vision right now of community. And that's pretty much Trump. And the blue zone has this great vision of community, but doesn't believe in authority. And that's a weird place to be in right now. If I were the Democrats and I believed I was going to believe in all these huge new taxes and income transfers and green new deals and enormous infrastructure, I'm going to transfer a lot of income from the rich to the poor. I would think I better believe in authority. How, how else am I going to enforce any of that? Right. Uh, that's right. It's and if I were Trump. And I believe in authority. I, I better have some, you know, I believe in police and military. You know, I mean, Trump, yeah, this is, you know, definitely believe in authority. But to what purpose, right? What vision of national community does he have? And I think it's almost that way in which you see how fragmented our country is. But I do think that if the blue zone wins, so to speak, in November, the red zone will test the blue zone. will basically say, well, we're just not going to obey. We're not going to pay that tax. We're not going to obey that regulation. And what are you going to do to stop us? Right. What, what's your authority? <laughs> what are you going to do? Now, much as we like to think when the blue zone was in power, you know, the, uh, you know, during the Obama years, and then when Trump took over, then we had our sanctuary cities and sanctuary states disagreeing on everything from, you know, marijuana to to uh, to ICE and uh, you know undocumented immigrants, uh, I never thought that secession by the blue zone was ever a serious threat because I think the blue zone feels ultimately it sort of inherits or deserves you know national institutions, national power. I do think that's that's a greater threat by the red zone. And, and don't forget, David, that one of the fourth turnings in our history was within the United States, right? Was not 
didn't involve a, a crisis yep. from someone outside the United States. Blue zone secessions, it's a lower probability event given the de-emphasis on Second Amendment rights and, and gun ownership. Red zone secession seems more probable, or at least more highly probable, if you consider who has uh, perhaps a little bit of muscle to say, we disagree, and we have the means by which to defend our opinions. Well, also the disbelief that the blue zone would do anything about it. Again, I mean, that's the point, right? So, yeah, I'm agreeing with you. And, and ultimately, you see that, too, in, in um, you know, the, the whole survival industry, you know, everything from, uh, you know, all, all of the, the, the safe rooms and, and the arms sales and all that hugely tanked when surprisingly Trump won the presidency in 2016. The bottom went out of that industry. Right. Uh, so all of this, all of the equity values, those at Republic, you know, collapsed. They're coming back up again, by the way, as the prospect of a Biden president. So, so that's an industry that's almost completely counter cyclical to uh, red zone being in power. Let's take the normal American pattern of crisis and victory, where that, that's generally been the case for us. Maybe you take the Civil War out, out of that mix, very different sort of an outcome, muddled outcome. It, difficult to, to define victory when, when we're killing ourselves. Let's say that the normal American pattern of crisis and victory is different this time. Maybe that reveals itself in the U.S. bond market suffering, the U.S. dollar reserve status being set back. What are the social dynamics you might expect if crisis leads not to victory, but to failure and to loss? Well, it's very different. I mean, it's accommodating ourselves to a diminished future. Uh, it's as simple as that. And we've, you know, my gosh, uh, Americans are so privileged. We've, we've never been through that experience. And it's also, I think, uh, you see that privilege, too, and in, in, in sort of unrealism about Americans when it comes to, you know, issues of nationality and whether their nation survives. I mean, Americans don't even think of that, right? If you're living in an Eastern European nation or you're living in, in most nations in Asia, you think about it all the time because your entire history has been your nation either being wiped out uh, or in the threat of being wiped out just imminently right there. And I think that's very difficult for America. We look around the world, it's hard for us to comprehend how differently other nations, other peoples uh, see the future much more contingently, right? Because of course, they face the reality in their own history of defeat many times, uh, subjections by other people. Americans aren't used to that. Uh, we tend to think that our culture is sort of a universal culture. Ultimately, everyone, everyone gravitates toward us. It's hard to see what true ideological competitor we have out there, except perhaps from China, uh, which actually claims itself to be a new system of organization, you know, superior to the one we have in the West. And, you know, they're, they're kind of run by experts. They, they have no problem with using markets and using just enough liberty to, to keep the prosperity engine going. They've been very successful. And this year, they're again, they're showing their success. China may be the only, almost certainly will be the only major economy in the world with no year over year loss in real GDP. Oh uh, my gosh, you know, look at where the European Union and the United States are going to come out on that. So again and again, I mean, China shows that its methods, which strike us clearly as oppressive, authoritarian, dictatorial, completely uh, unfair and abusive to minorities, they'll just say what we have works. Um, and in the end, history, you know, history is written by the victors, right? That's the other thing we forget. You know, there's an old Eastern European joke about that, where I, I don't know whether it was a Bulgarian or, or, a, or a, uh, a Romanian or a Pole, but he used to say, gee, I, I, I wonder what the world is going to be like. You know, I wonder what the future is going to be like in 15 years. And, and the, the other person says, can't possibly tell that. We don't even know what the past is going to be like in 15 years. <laughs> so, but that's the point, right? <laughs> Who knows how in the future we're going to rewrite the past and how we're going to reinterpret everything. Uh, that's one thing, by the way, as an historian, I constantly emphasize when I talk to, you know, listeners. And that is we look on the past and we just think we're seeing it as it was. No, we're seeing it interpreted as the winners wrote it. Right. It would have been written very differently if another people had won. 
or if another kind of cultural or social or political outcome had been gained. And, um, you know, that's when you're looking forward, you have to realize that as well. Neil, I have four kids, um, the ages of 14 down to six. They're growing up in a period of turmoil that, frankly, doesn't look like it's going to be short lived. So arguably things will get worse before they get better. I'm going to ask you something I don't think I've asked you before, but advise me as a father how to navigate this time in their development so that they're capable of engaging the world effectively with uh, the mindset and skills to flourish uh, despite external pressures, challenges, and change, perhaps uh, in, in change on a level we, we haven't seen in, in, in decades. Do you have wisdom you might share that addresses the generational differences in perspective and the radically different worlds we have and will in the future live in? Well, I think this post-millennial generation, we often call them homeland generation. The first of them were born in the shadow of the Department of Homeland Security. And, and I will have to say, David, they're literally at home more than any other generation in our history. I mean, you know, the, these are the you know, the quarantines, right? <laughs> you think of them right now. So anyway, there they are. Uh, and I think one thing you will, you will see is that this generation raised at a time of crisis. First of all, uh, they will be carefully protected by Gen X is basically raising them there. I think one of the most amazing things and uh, I think predictable things that we see historically is that this Gen X kind of generation uh, tends to be very protective as parents. And, and we predicted that originally, and I think it's coming out to be true. They're enormously, you know, they, they keep tabs on these kids to make sure they're not doing anything dangerous. You know, none of the dangerous stuff they did, you know, when they were young, home alone, right? So I think, I think that that is something that you want to do because it comes to you naturally and these kids expect it. It will be a dangerous time, right? They will look to older people for clues, for guidance. They will be generally very well behaved and they will respond well to optimism about the future. Get a bunch of Xers and Boomers together and they're often, you know, you know, very uh, kind of a lot of gallows humor about where the future is going to go. I think this is a generation who responds very well to optimism that through all this stuff that's going to happen, we'll create a better world. Uh, right. We've done so repeatedly in the past. We will do it again. And that this, you know, the, the, these period of troubles is the price we pay for a golden age. That's what you need to get there. And that's what's always happened historically. And we'll do it again. And they will be able to inherit that. They will be able to improve it. I mean, they will be the ones who come in, hopefully just after the crisis either is over or is closing. And then have the leisure and luxury to improve things, to take us up to an even higher level, you know, not to deal with the horrible things, but to take us up and, and you know, enjoy even higher levels of civilization. The parallel, you know, we talk about, I haven't talked about this in this conversation, David, but in my work is I haven't talked about archetypes for generations, how each generation belongs to an archetype. It has a particular kind of location in history, and it has a certain script that has a certain life cycle script. And um, this generation that we see as kids today has much in common with the silent generation that was just too young to fight in World War II, uh, but just too old later on to be, you know, a free spirit during the late 60s, you know, just, just too old to be hippies. Uh, this was actually Joe Biden's generation. And by the way, the silent generation has never had a president. The only generation in American history never to produce a president. But at the very last, clearly their absolutely last chance to produce a president, it looks as though this generation may well do it, right? <laughs> With Joe Biden, right? Those who came of age uh, in the 50s, uh, very early 60s. And that generation grew up as kids, heavily protected. It was dangerous during the Great Depression and World War II. They were looked over. Remember the image of child back then was sort of Shirley Temple, the little rascals. These were you know, well-behaved kids with a tight envelope of, of parental and community protection. And they were very well-behaved coming of age. And they had very long time horizons and they played by the rules. And Joe Biden's generation absolutely did that. 
You know, they, they were absolute conformists. Uh, Fortune magazine had a famous uh, cover story in 1949 called The College Class of 49, and the subtitle was Taking No Chances. Their first questions on uh, job interviews was about their pension plan. <laughs> you can believe that. And they actually got the name, the silent generation, because they kept their heads down during the McCarthy era. They didn't want to raise any waves. They didn't want anything to go on their permanent record. And you can see that about kids today, you know, very careful about what goes on the Internet, what gets recorded. All right, same thing. Um, and this will be, I think, like all generations, the generation we need right now um, and a generation which will serve to take us where we need to go. Coming of age, coming into adult careers, beginning to come in at least young leadership roles uh, once the crisis is over. Well, I look forward to our next conversation. Perhaps we can circle back around to early 2022. We'll have you know, midterms that we could certainly banter about, and we'll have a new book uh, that we can discuss and look forward to that. Thank you for your contributions from the 80s through the 90s, the research and writing that you're still doing. We look forward to continuing the, the learning. We know we put in a lot of work into uh, distilling that and uh, we're the beneficiaries of it. If you haven't read the book, The Fourth Turning, uh, what the cycles of history tell us about America's next rendezvous with destiny, I think it's a must read. Um, it's been required reading here in our office going back um, 15, almost 20 years and fourth turning. Here's our fourth conversation uh, with the author, uh, <laughs> co-author of, of The yes. Fourth Turning. <laughs> and we look forward to the fifth. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, Dave. You've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck, along with David McIlvaney and our guest today, Neil Howe. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com. And you can call us at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.